this inspired insider.com interview we talk with ron douglas founder of recipesecrets.net which he turned into a multi-million dollar publishing company just listen to what he talks about and what he had to endure as a child and growing up and what he did differently in his life to make his kids and his family better he gets so personal that we both tear up at one point that and much more Welcome to the show, Ron Douglas. Joining me now is Ron Douglas. Welcome to Good Day New York. But I can't wait for this. This Ron Douglas is here. Ron, come on over here. How are you? Quit his job at Wall Street down at J.P. Morgan to take care of the kids and build a successful online business from home. Douglas says his website gets more than a million hits each month. RecipeSecrets.net, we have over 200,000 email subscribers. What's next for Ron? A second book is already in the works. And Very thrilling. It's new to me, and it's just a blessing all around. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. You know, Ron captivated me. I saw him speak at a seminar and he del delivered amazing content while sharing really personal stories that came from the heart. So I really wanted to have Ron on. And Ron, thanks for being here for one. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Um, so Ron Douglas is the founder of RecipeSecrets.net. Uh, it's a multi-million dollar publishing, publishing business that he started during his lunch break while working at Chase. And he became a New York Times best-selling author and scored $5.8 million in free advertising from the media. Um, he sold over 1.1 million books. He's been featured on Fox News, Good Morning America, NBC, The Home Shopping Network seven times, uh, The Wendy Williams Show, and People Magazine, and many more. And... Um, just for on for people who don't know, tell them about res, you know RecipeSecrets.net. What is it? It's pretty cool. All right. Well, aside from all those other uh, media places I've been on, now I'm on in Inspired Insider as well. That's right. That's the <laughs> most important. At that too. Yeah, it's most important. Uh, RecipeSecrets.net is a site for people who like cooking, who like uh, sharing recipes. It's a community on the site where people can share co cooking tips. The main theme, the main niche for the site is uh, restaurant recipes, so copycat restaurant recipes. So a lot of people are interested in knowing how to make their favorite dishes from chain restaurants like Red Lobster, Cheesecake Factory, you know, TGI Fridays. We specialize in making, kind of reverse engineering those recipes, making copycat versions of those recipes, and we you know, publish uh, cookbooks and email newsletters and things like that around that basic uh, theme. Yeah, KFC, chicken. Right. KFC. You discovered the secret. Um, you know, Ron's going to talk to us today about overcoming big challenges in life and business and, you know, because many people go through tough times and have things standing in their way, anywhere from personal issues, money, health, and what these, you know, things sometimes seem insurmountable. So Ron's going to talk to us about some of the things that he's overcome. And I always like to include a fun fact about people. Um, and Ron's fun fact is he was actually top five top scorers in the history at his college. Where'd you go to college? Uh, Stony Brook University out in Long Island. Small school, Division One. Yeah, I love it. Um, so, Ron, getting into your story a little bit, uh, talking about some of the big challenges, what was your childhood like? My childhood was uh, inspiring. <laughs> it, was, it motivated me to be what I am today. You know, I, Should I tell a story about my, uh, my dad and whatnot? Yeah, yeah. Talking about that briefly. For sure. Yeah. Well, when I say inspiring, it kind of inspired me to to have a traditional family, to work from home. It inspired me later on in life and in business. And the reason was uh, my mom and my dad, you know, they met early on in life. That My mom was 19. My, my dad was 20. And they hit it off. They, they both struggled with uh, heroin addiction back then. So wow. they actually met in a heroin rehab clinic. And they were trying to clean up their life. And... They fell in love, you know, she, they got pregnant with me, and this was in uh, 1974, 
And they ended up getting married in April of 1974, which is a really happy time for them. And um, you know, my, my, my father, aside from being you know, addicted to heroin at the time, he was also a, a drug dealer. And he, he ran with a rough crowd in Yonkers, New York, and he was a hustler. Wow. And he was actually at the rehab because he had got caught in, a, in one of the biggest uh, drug busts in Westchester County history at the time. Wow. And, um, you yeah, know, he wasn't, you know, he was clean at the time, but he kind of pleaded to, you know, being a user instead. And being it was the first offense, they sentenced him to, to rehab. So, as I said, they got married in April 1974. In August of 1974, six weeks before I was born, my dad was found dead on a rooftop. Wow. He was overdosed with heroin. And it was believed that his past caught up with him, the people that he was uh, hustling for you know, killed him. I don't know if he owed them money or they thought he snitched on them. I'm, you know, I never got the complete story and it was mm. never covered in the the news or not. You know, it's never, they never, they never said whether it was a, a murder or a um, suicide. But everybody that I speak to says it, it was a, a murder, but they never found out who did it. So my mother, it was six weeks later, October 1974, I was born. So my, there's my mom. She's a newlywed, just lost a husband, wow. you know, just had a new baby. And she kind of went into a deep depression for the next couple of years, or, you know, first couple of years of my life. And she um, went back into heavy drug use. And I, we, I moved in with my, my grandparents at the time. Yeah. And, you know, that, that whole story, you know, having a rough upbringing and, and, you know, being in a single parent home, moving in with my grandparents, you know, my mother struggling and, that just motivated me to uh, want to be have a, a tra tra traditional family. Wanted to, you know, do the best for my kids and be there, work at home, and and you know have a business the the way I. It just inspired me later on in life. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're a young kid. That's just. I'm sorry to hear all of that, and it's just a hard thing to go through. Do you remember one of those points where your, you know, mom wasn't around and you were with your grandparents? That was kind of a low point for you. Yeah, yeah. The one point I can remember is uh, my mom was heavy on drugs, and she used to kind of go on these binges where she would disappear for like a week at a time, sometimes two weeks. And I remember just one time as a kid, I might have been four years old or five years old, but this is one of the things I remember, is just looking out the window like, you know, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night and wondering if she was still alive, like kind of just, wow. I was just a kid just crying by the window like, waiting for her to come home and she just you know wasn't around at the time and my grand i remember my grandmother consoling me telling me uh you know don't worry about it just go to sleep she'll be here soon don't cry she's trying to make me feel better but yeah. that was uh one of the low points i can remember from my childhood yeah so what did your grandparents do how did they kind of help you get through that well they just i don't know they just loved me you know they just talked told me, you know, your mom is sick and we're trying to get her help. And, you know, like I, I reconciled with my mother and we have a good relationship now. It's just, you know, she was 19, 20 years old when, when she, she was 19 when she had me. And, you know, she was a baby herself and right. going through all the stuff that she went through. You know, she kind of just fell into a depression and went back into drug use. So, yeah, I'm, so I don't want to throw her under the bus because she's, you know, cleaned up her act. She's doing great. Right. Now, you know, but, um, well, it was a tough, tough time. For everyone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what do you take from your grandparents um, on how you, you have, you have children. What do you take from them and apply it to how you raise your, your kids? Right. Well, my, my grandfather, especially, you know, he was, uh, he was my dad, you know, and you know, he passed away uh, huh. about six years ago. Sorry but to he's hear still, that. Still, he was my father figure, you know, he was my, my male role model. So, I guess the one thing I take from that is that, um, you know, how, how much of that stuff you remember later on in life, like the times with that role model and, and how what you do influences your, your kids, you know, and, and how they uh, remember, you know, what it was like, what their childhood was like. And they were like little things you remember. And I'm, I'm careful to the, the way I interact with them because I know that this is going to impact them later on in life like you know i remember every little thing with my my grandfather especially and you know i'm careful what i say to them you know how, how i say things how i phrase things and 
I'm always positive. I'm always encouraging them. I'm always telling mm-hmm. them you could do anything you want to do. You could be anything you want to be. And um, I'm always there. You know, like I- I'm blessed to be able to work from home, to always be there, you know, to be at soccer right. games, to be, um, you know, just to be a part of their life. And it's a huge impact later on. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, people you grew up with, um, you know, are in similar situations. Um, you know, everyone takes a different path and you've taken really the path of success, um, and striving ahead. What inspires you to strive? Right. Well, it was the whole thing with my, uh, my kids, you know, like what really inspired me, I I would say, you know, I'm, I'm a type of person, like if you tell me I can't do something, I, I, I think I can and I'll try to do it. You know, I just, I'm that type of of person I, I, it's two ways like you could take that like, growing up in the neighborhood i grew up in jamaica queens a pretty tough neighborhood and uh you know a lot of my friends were drug dealers and you know a lot of them were high school dropouts and right. you know it's two ways it affects you it's either it polarizes you one way or the other it's right. either you use it as an excuse to say you know you know nobody from this neighborhood really succeeds and who am i to, i don't right. think i can do this like they, you know you use it as an excuse like like I'm not gonna be able to succeed with this, and it, it, and it tempers down your your expectations of yourself, you know, based on your past. So some people take that route. Other people, you know, it's one or two ways you can go. The other way is what I used it as. I use it as motivation. Mm-hmm. I use it as you know, when I get a chance to have a family and to you know make money and get out there, things are gonna be different for me. You know, it's never, it's not gonna be like this for me. And that's kind of like the motivating thing, and especially with my father not being there, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when I have kids, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be the world's best dad. You know, I'm gonna have a, not gonna have dysfunction in my household, not gonna have mm-hmm. arguing and police coming by the house and all type of crazy stuff. You know, so I think that really inspired me that way to just kind of do the right thing, to work hard. And another thing I think. You know, sports was really. Yeah, good. I was going to ask how you got through because I'm sure you're hanging out with people, and if they're doing drugs or dealing drugs, you know, we fall into the same things that our friends are doing. How did you escape that that route? Right. Yeah. Since I was six years old, I, I've been playing basketball. Like it was my first love. You know, it's just you know I had a hoop in my backyard. Like where we we took an old bicycle rim and pulled out the spokes. And, uh, you know, I might have been, I was six years old. I, I did that and I put it up on the garage <laughs> and we, I nailed it up with nails and a hammer. And wow. it, it sucked. It was, you know, but it, it, it was a hoop. You know, we started playing. We started playing hoops. Like every day, like people in the neighborhood used to come by and we would just play and play and play. And then I started playing at the local uh, police athletic league. And, you know, sports kind of does something to you. Like I wanted to go to the NBA. I wanted to, it made me want to go to college because that was the route to, go to the NBA and to, you know, all that stuff. So it made me want to get good grades because if you didn't have good grades, you couldn't play for the team, you know, in high school and college. So it, it kept me focused on a, on a goal. Yeah, and, and it showed me that, you know, hard work kind of pays off. Like, like I used to wake up in the, in the morning, you know, at, at like eight, nine years old and, and jog to the playground, but not the closer playground, the one that was like a mile away, just so I could jog there and I, you know, early in the morning in the summertime before the, the sun would come up, before it would get too hot, and, you know, 6 a.m., and I'd be out there just shooting jump shots. And, and I noticed that the more I shot, the more I worked on my ball handling, the w- more hard work I put in, the better I got. And it was mm-hmm. like a, a reward for, okay, I did this hard work, and now it's paying off. Now I'm going to the playground, yeah. or I'm in the backyard, and I'm, I'm getting better than these other guys. And It mm-hmm. just showed me the hard work early on paid off and I kind of adopted that that worth that work ethic later on in life also. I mean that's pretty remarkable from a young age. I mean, I don't know if someone could kick me and get me up at 6 a.m. What caused you to think like that? Did you see that you have a role model or someone you looked up to who was in the NBA and you you heard them say something about waking up? What made you even think to wake up in, at 6 a.m., run there and shoot jump shots, you know, for hours? You know, what motivated me was just my friends and, and people I played against being better than me. <laughs> you know, I would get my ass kicked in the playground. I would play with the older kids. 
And I'm like, okay, I'm going to work on my skills. I'm going to get better than these guys. So I would, you know, do that in the morning. And then, you know, later on after school or later on, you know, go to the police athletic league, you know, like three, four, five o'clock. I would play again and play versity against these guys. And, you know, being at practice that morning, I would kind of be sharp, you know. And it, I, I, think, I just think competition is what motivated me. Yeah. And, and I know fear of embarrassment. Like it's, it's some really good play. New York City playgrounds. It's really good players. I know that family is important to you, and you think back on some of those times in a childhood, and you know it still affects you. Um, what happens? You're saying something about when you watch certain movies, um, you it affects you. What was right. one of those? What what happened with one of those movies? Right. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about. Just thinking back on my own childhood and, you know, I, I was talking, I don't know if you could tell, I was about to cry just a minute ago. <laughs> As I was talking to you, I was kind of getting uh, emotional yeah, and I had emotional. to kind of suck it back in. You know, it's like just thinking about like how blessed I am now to be in the situation I am now and how it used to be and how, you know, like like seeing fathers, father and son relationships, especially in, in movies like that movie uh, Forrest Gump at the very end. And they're playing that like emotional music and and mm -hmm. Forrest Gump after all he went through like he's seeing his son get on the school bus and his son is so smart and he's so proud of his son and he's right. like you know little Forrest I love you that type of thing and you know I can't watch that without crying yeah. you know like the movie uh, Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith and his son and yes. some of the advice and how he did all this stuff for his son yeah you know, like like there's a part in the movie where where he, he couldn't afford to put his son in a good uh, daycare, you know, so he's putting it in the, and the lady was just, wasn't doing anything for his son, just making him watch TV the whole time and ignoring him. And, you know, and it, it just, something about that, just like, ah, oh, man, that was crazy to me. And, and then yeah. later on, like he, when he finally made it and, you know, he was able to do better things for his family, like those type of movies just make me yeah. emotional. Yeah. That's because of my, my, my childhood. Yeah. It inspires you to, you know, provide for your kids and what you want to do with your family. Um, what's been, you know, talk about some of the low points. What's been a proud moment and personally, and then I obviously want to hear about professionally too, but start off personally, what's been a proud moment for you that you think back on? Well, well personally, there were two, two proud moments, I would say. The, the first was, uh, you know, my, my mom, like the house that I grew up in, my mom eventually inherited the house when my grandparents died. And she was struggling financially. And me and her, you know, we're in a good place right now. We made amends. But, um, you know, this was 2006. And I was uh, working at J.P. Morgan. And I was also working at my business. And I was pretty much making as much, or probably, probably more. I was making more from my business than I was from J.P. Morgan. So I was just kind of banking the J.P. Morgan checks. And um, she was struggling financially. And she was going into foreclosure with the, with the house. Wow. And I was able to step in and and i remember writing a check for for thirty three thousand five hundred something like that wow. over 33 grand just writing a check for it and i just felt like i was like wow and in that position you're I, saving uh, the the sort of where you the house you grew, grew up in, in. Right. yeah and I, I was able to write that check and bring it back current and then you know refinance it and and you know, put the house in my name and whatnot. And she still lives there to this day, and I'm still paying that bill every month. But I rent out the upstairs, and I'm kind of responsible for it now. But it kind of sucks sometimes. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I was able to do that. My brother was living there at the time, and my, my elderly aunt and my uh, sister was also living there. So I kind of, like, saved their house. Yeah. So that felt good to be able That's to be amazing. in a position to do that after growing up there. The other thing was... Uh, my uh, my mother's my my mother-in-law my wife's wife's mother, she was working uh, two jobs living in Coney Island, a rough part of Coney Island, struggling, and we were able to buy a two-family house on Long Island and move her in with us. Oh wow! Kind of you know, watch the kids during the day while I'm working and stuff like that. So that's amazing. We changed her life. We retired her to uh, bring her in and help out with us. So that, that, that felt good as well, just doing things for, for family like that and just being in a position to, to do that. You know? Yeah, that's really amazing. And what about something, I know there's probably a, a proud moment where because of the situation you're in and the success you've had that you were able to do for your kids. 
what's one of those moments that you remember that you could you know have a certain day with your kids or do something with your kids that um, you think back on that you're really proud of oh that's all the time that's you know I'm always there like my daughter oh yeah I could tell you one time in particular my my daughter was having a uh, uh, Christmas play at her school. She goes to uh, All Saints, uh, a private school up the block, and um, they were having a Christmas play. And it was at uh, it was ten o'clock in the morning, somewhere around there. And a lot of parents couldn't make it at the time. And there was this one kid in particular. His mother didn't show up. And when it came time for him to participate in his, for his part in the play. He was looking around for his mom, and he just broke down and started crying. Oh, wow. And I, I couldn't believe I was like, oh, man. But eventually his mother actually came in, but she came in like maybe 30 minutes late, like after his part. And he was just crying and crying, and he couldn't get through his part. Oh, and That's heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. And I just thought to myself, all right, would, would, would my daughter do the same thing? <laughs> I think the kid was overly emotional, but I was just felt proud that I was able to just be there. Yeah. You know? To watch my daughter, and I'm I'm there like for everything they do, soccer games and and you know yeah. Christmas plays and pageants and school things. I'm at I'm at everything. So yeah, I mean the reason I want to have this conversation too is because people see you or other people who are very successful and they think, oh that person got lucky or it came easy, and you had overcome not only a lot personally but professionally. You had to work your butt off. What was one of those? professional moments that you were that you're especially proud of when you look back on after all this hard work right well professionally the one thing i could think of is uh i was in a tough situation where i had a, a newborn you know two, 2004 i had a newborn baby my, my daughter was born and we had just bought a house and um i had to still work like i couldn't just give up my job like I didn't feel comfortable doing just giving up my job so I was working on my business part-time and at nights you know at nights and on the weekends you know I would work 60 hours a week on Wall Street and then come home and work another 40 hours a week on my business I would just squeeze wow. the time in on, on the weekends and, and at nights and um, you know I remember the, the best part of my day was coming home and hear my daughter say daddy is home you know and then one day, I promised her she would say that every day, and it would be that's the one thing I would look forward to. And um, one day I said to her, you know, one day Daddy's gonna be home with you all the time. So that was what I needed to kind of focus on, uh, you know, taking the business to a next level, so mm -hmm. like I could feel comfortable. It's kind of irresponsible. Like I hear a lot of people saying, like, you know, I just one day I just walked in and told my boss "f you" and I quit. You know what I mean? That's cool if you're living with your mom. But if you got a mortgage, you have a family, pay, yeah, yeah, and a family, and, and you gotta provide for a wife and kids, it's, that's irresponsible. Like, you know, what I mean, I, I I don't make crazy risky decisions like that. Even though, you know, it probably would have paid. You know, it probably would have worked out because I already had started my business, but I couldn't bring myself to do that. So every day at, at work, I would go into work, and I would have this piece of paper on the board on on, on my cube that said. January 2008, right? And that was the day, no matter what, I was going to walk out of there. And I was just saving my money and, and, and working on my business and focusing more and more on my business and less and less on a job. So they, uh, in July 2007, I guess they could sense that I was no longer into it like I was. And I don't know, maybe they knew that I was, you know, eventually found out that I had a, a, a business and I was making money outside of their corporate world. So pretty much they made me train my replacement, right, and didn't tell me that, you know, that he was going to be my replacement. So they hired oh, this guy. Oh, they just said we have a new him. person, will you help yeah, train them? Yeah, yeah. And he was making, you know, at the time I was making 101500 That was my yearly salary. And he, they brought him in making seventy grand. So I guess they, you know, they wanted to save that money. They made me replace him. And then one day, oh, they, made, they made me train him. And then one day he came to me and he was like, well, the boss wants to make sure that uh, you show me everything you know because... Did you know, he know that or no? Did he know? I don't he, know. Oh, I he don't didn't. Know. Maybe. Maybe. Okay. I, I'm not sure. He was a good guy. I have nothing against him. Yeah. And I, I just thought that was weird. So I started seeing the red, red flags. But I was still doing a great job there. The clients loved me. The internal clients loved me. You know, I was there for a while. But um, you know, one day they told me that we were having a meeting in the office and... 
and it was going to be like a budget meeting. And he told me to meet them there at one o'clock. So when I get in there, and I noticed that early on that day, the IT guys, they knew because they were, they were going to have to, you know, disconnect my computer and whatnot. So they knew. So they were actually horrible. Quiet. Right. So I didn't know what was going on. So, so as you it, walk in, go, they're dismembering your computer in your, your workstation. I, I walk into the office and it's just me, the, the uh, finance director of, that, of our division and uh, the HR person. And that was it. I, and none of the other teammates, you know, were there. And I knew, immediately I knew what was going on. So they fired me, laid me off. And uh, pretty much walked me out the building. Like, like it was just crazy. After all that service, you know, after all those years of working with them. Because how long was, were you there for? I was there for uh, six years. Wow. Six years at the time. And they walked me out of there like I stole something. It was just like escorted me out. Like, I couldn't, like, I wanted to go back to my computer. The computer, they had taken the computer away. So I couldn't get into any of my files. And they just said, you have to leave right now. So, so that's that's loyalty, man. That, that's corporate loyalty, man. And don't think it can't happen to you if you work in a job. You know, you're just a like. I always look at it like this: if you're working for someone else, what you really are is an expense to that person. Especially if you're not working on revenue-producing activities, right. you're an expense to that person. They they write you a check, so that's part. Of it. So when they look at how can I cut back my expenses and make more money. You're on the table. Your salary is on the table. Yeah. Like whether you know it or not, you could be doing a great job. It's a scary thing. Scaled back, yeah, for sure. For sure. So that's and, – and, you know, after that, it was a good feeling, like, not having to wonder what I was going to do. That was a turning point exactly for you. So that was do. a turning point for you, right? I mean, I, when that happened – so what happened after, after that um, they let you go? Right, right. After that, I came home and I uh, – I remember like I had a box of my things and I'm on the train and I called my wife and I told her and she was like, yeah, well, that's a blessing. It's about time. You were ready to leave there anyway. So they pulled the plug on me early because I was planning to leave there January 2008 and I didn't know if I was going to be able to do it. And they, they did me a favor by laying me off. And uh, my business kind of just took off because I was able to focus on it 100% after that, you know, and it kind of took off. And after that, I ended up getting a, a book deal with... Uh, with Simon and Schuster, ended up getting uh, media coverage. I got on Fox Business. For the story they went with on Fox Business was a uh, former Wall Street manager uh, leaves his job at J.P. Morgan to pursue his passion of cooking. So I, you know that was the story. They liked that story. And had I been working at J.P. Morgan, I would have never got on Fox Business because that was the story they, they loved. Mm-hmm. This was 2008, like right in the middle of the financial crisis. So yeah. This was his story. So that that interview ended up helping me get the book deal. With Simon and Schuster, because from that I was like, when I pitched the, when the, the uh, literary agent pitched the book deal to publishers, he was able to use that interview and saying it's already getting media attention. This guy's already selling books on his own. This thing mm-hmm. is already hot. And within 90 days, I had a book deal, six figure advance with uh, with Simon and Schuster. Wow. And since then, I've done. Uh, I just finished up my fifth book with them, coming out in uh, early next year, early 2014. And you know I've sold uh, 1.2 million books now. You said 1.1 before, and I was like, a I misspoke. Million books, yeah. Became a New York Times bestseller. You know I got on you know all those different TV places that you mentioned at the beginning of the interview, and it just was a, a tipping point for me. And it's amazing, like once you once you take that step, how doors open for you. Like if you can communicate with other people during the day, <laughs> you know what I mean, like. If you're available at 11 o'clock in the morning, you don't have to report to some boss or be at some cubicle yeah. at that time. And you, you could do it. You know, you have that freedom. Yeah. Start meeting other people to have that same type of freedom. Yeah. You know, and those are the people you want to meet. Those are the entrepreneurs. Those are the people that are successful. And, yeah. and, and, and it's just it just opens all type of doors when you move that, remove that con- nine to five constraint. constraint. I mean, it, took, it took some time for you to get there, though. What were some of the initial steps? And some people have struggled just getting their first few sales. What was some steps you took to get traction early on so that you could put yourself in a position to eventually quit? Or even when you get fired, you are like, no big deal. I'm, I'm already you know, running this successful business. What did you do early on to get traction? Well, I kind of became obsessed with internet marketing and, and how it's done. And I was just 
following all the people and modeling what they did. I'm pretty good at looking at what other people are doing and kind of modeling that and seeing what's working. Mm -hmm. And I think a big thing for me is I learned early on that, you know, everybody only has 24 hours in a day. You know, you got to sleep, you got to eat, you got to have some type of social life. So, you know, at most, maybe you got 10 hours a day to actually work. So everyone has that same time. So what is it that makes some people achieve these great results and other people just struggle, you know, when they all have the same maybe 10 hours to work? Yeah. Um, and it's leverage. It's it's being able to leverage other people's time, other people's uh, capital, other people's uh, motiv motivated interests. You know, being able to leverage just other people's assets, email lists, and and sites. You know, online especially. So one thing that allows you to leverage that is having a product that people want to buy, and then having an affiliate program where people can make money from that product. I mean, it sounds simple, but that's really leverage because, you know, people can promote your product, right, that you never even met before from anywhere. Just get a link to promote it and make money, and you can wake up to, you know, $1,000, $2,000 from someone that just promoted your product. You know, that's being able to leverage other people's assets and giving them a reason mm -hmm. to to help you make money. You know, they, mm -hmm. they motivated made it motivated by that offer you have that converts. So that's, you know, that's it in a nutshell. And also being able to leverage, you know, put back some of the money that you make into getting more traffic, you know, whether you buy traffic, yeah. you know, pay someone to to do ad words for you is one of the things I, I did early on. Just getting traffic. And another leverage point is when you start getting the traffic to your site, and I don't know if we should turn this into like more of an internet marketing discussion. This is more of a motivational, inspirational thing, but... No, I mean, some of those tactical things are always good to throw in there because from what you're saying is, you know, someone out there may be like, how do I get out of this rat race? Right. You're saying, well, you need to create something, some kind of product to leverage yourself. And then you need to get people, you know, have a, a affiliate program or something where people can promote it so that you're not just having to spend all your time and energy doing it, but you're help, having other people help you. And then increasing, right. you know, having an expert help you with maybe driving traffic or doing things you know, it could be for any, it could be for a service, it could be for a product uh, or something like that. So you're, I think that's helpful to, for them to hear because maybe they're in that situation. They're like, you know, how do I, now right. I... And it, it sounds like basic, you know, internet marketing one-on-one, -on -one, but if you think about it in the context of this is how I'm making the most out of my time, out of the limited time and resources I have, I'm able to use that leverage yeah. to get other people to help me with my business because you know like i'd rather have a thousand people you know making one dollar than myself trying to make a thousand dollars you know right. what i mean it's like you leverage their time leverage their assets and the other thing is once you start getting that traffic to your site you have to start thinking about like how am i going to get future traffic you know like how am i going to you know build it like a real asset and the one real asset you have is your email list so that's an asset so if you think about how much it costs to buy traffic you know, having an email list is so valuable because you can produce that traffic just by sending an email. Right. You know, that's that's the ultimate leverage. You can just boom send an email. And, you know, like like today, I have uh, two hundred forty thousand people on my email list. Wow. And I send out an email. You know, forty thousand people might open it. That's at a lot of reach. Time. Yeah. You know, so that that's just power. That's just reach. Like, how much would it cost you to to have, get forty thousand? views of anything right you know if you have a, a brick and mortar business yeah it's a, equivalent to almost like if you're in a football stadium and everyone's just watching you do something or, or you know right. something like that it's probably even more than a football stadium right yeah. and that's just the power of it and that's like and I, that did that didn't just happen one day it's like that's something you build up over right. time and a lot of people say okay well you know i've been you know, I, I built up a list, you know, I got maybe uh, 1,200 people on my list and I sent an email, I don't make that much money. You know, you have to look at it like those 1,200, you know, you double that, it could be 2,400, you double that, 40, you know, you keep building towards it and as long as you have something that keeps them interested in your email, some type of content based on their interests that makes them want to open your emails in the future. And if you're just sending them ads, 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 you're burning out your list. You have to have something that keeps them like opening, like, okay, this Jeremy, you know, he's the inspiring, inspirational guy. I know when I open his emails, it's gonna be something that gets me fired up to, right. to you know, do work. Yeah. And, and and if you have that, 
you know, those initial 1,200 might still be on your list five years from now. And then you build that over time. Before you know it, you've built this big, giant asset. And whenever you're sending out an email, you know, you're making thousands of dollars. You know, and a lot of people can't see past the immediate type of uh, gratification. They can't yeah. see, like, long term. They can't see, like, one year, two years away. And they, they end up spinning their wheels, buying one product after the next, building other sites, like building, you know, this, building that. Instead of, if you just focused on that one thing, the same amount of time that you would spend, you know, it takes people sometimes a year or two just to even figure this thing out. If you took that yeah. same year into it, instead of like just buying products, focusing on jumping from one thing to the next, if you just focused on that one thing, building that email list, keeping those people happy, in the next two years, you'll be much better off. You'll have a real asset than if you were just spinning your wheels, you know, jumping from one site to the next, trying one strategy after the next, and, and never really building anything concrete, just building a bunch of little things that don't add up. One thing you mentioned, yeah. one thing you mentioned that's really important and really key that you do really well is, um, early on, you said you modeled. You modeled success. You didn't try and reinvent the wheel. You modeled people, you modeled what was working. Who was someone early on that you um, saw as saw a virtual mentor who you modeled to to get to where you are. Right. Well, I modeled everybody, man. Yannick Silver was a, the guy I, I modeled. Uh, Corey Rudel at the time. You know, uh, rest in peace. He, he was a big person I, I modeled. Uh, who else? Uh, Joe Vitale. Like all the, you know, Ken Eboy, all the gurus at the time back, you know, and it wasn't that many back then, you know, like being a guru was something real special back then. It was like maybe a handful, like 10 of them or something, you know. And, uh, you know, I just modeled what they were, were doing, what they were teaching. I got a, yeah. on all their email lists. You know, nowadays, anybody is claiming to be a guru. Like, everybody's a guru. It's like a thousand of them or something, you know. It's like everybody's claiming the title. But back then, you know, those guys were really kind of pioneers in my mind. Mm -hmm. What about, what's one thing? I mean, we've talked about a lot of stuff. And what's one thing you tell the audience to do right now to get started overcoming personal challenges or business challenges. I know you do something um, in the morning. Right, right. What is that? Well, we talk about overcoming personal challenges and even business challenges as well. There's two things that, I, that are rituals for me. The, the first thing is, uh, you know, just to, like some days you wake up and you don't have the same confidence. You, you, you might be down on yourself. You might, you know, think like everything's not going your way and, and, you know, what am I going to do? Like, oh, you start to have self-doubt. But the one thing that, that I do is I have this index card. And on one side of the index card, there's everything that I'm proud of, like things that I'm, I'm proud of, right, that, that I'm thankful for mm -hmm. on one side. And the other side of the uh, index card is the things that I've kind of, like, accomplished and, and what, I, what I still have to accomplish, what I want to accomplish. So it's kind of like what I've done and what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So it kind of just, you're looking at that and you read that every morning like as a ritual, kind of like a positive affirmation of, of yeah. you know, and it gives you energy and, and it gives you focus. And it says, okay, yeah. well, I'm, these are the things I'm proud of. These are the things that I've accomplished. These are the things that I'm thankful for. And these are the things that I still want to do, you know, and it, it puts you in the right mindset where it kind of removes that, that doubt from your mind. You know, and it frames it, your day the way you want it. The other thing that um, that's important is just, you know, making checklists, you know, the night before, like things I want to do the next day. You know, it, it sounds easy, but if you do three things every day, at the end of the month, you could have 90 things done, you know, three important things that you focus on every day. And you want to write those down the night before and then try to accomplish them the, the next day. And it just keeps you focused on what you need to do. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of, time, a lot of times you might be, on Facebook, you know, wasting time and, and chatting with people and liking cat pictures and whatnot, and, you know, memes and, and you know, and uh, when you say, when, you look, when you're on there wasting time and you, you look at that list and you're like, damn, I still got this to do. Let me log off and, and go do it. Yeah. You know, it kind of keeps, keeps you, you focused. Focused. Yeah. 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 I like that. Um, that's perfect. Um, and that's, you know, anyone could do that. Get an index card and just, you know, put that on there and make that list of priorities. No, right. I've won this. I mean, it's, it has a huge impact on your what you accomplish. You know, it sounds like simple things, but it's a simple thing like those two things, two simple things like that can have a huge impact on yeah. what you end up accomplishing, what you achieve. 
Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, I have one last question, Ron, which I've been eager to ask you about. Um, but before I ask it, just tell us what's exciting you know, with you now with the business, what's going on, what sites should people check out to find out more? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, right now one of the things I, I'm doing is I'm helping other uh, people who want to self-publish or want to get a book deal or just want to build a huge following of, you know, not just people that are on your email list but fans, like people that really – look forward to right. following you and, and, and reading your emails and how to build a list like that and if you have a book deal if you you know if you're trying to get a book deal you need to have a platform you need to have that in place if you're just trying to have an online business you need to have that asset and I think that's the one thing that I have become an expert in and that that have, has influenced my career more than anything else and I, I'm helping other people do that now and I have this site called publisheracademy.com where you can sign up and you know, get on my email list and I share my, my best tips and what's working for me. And I have a video on there after you sign up that shows you more details of how I did what I did, how I sold a, you know, over a million books, how I got a book deal, how I got on in, in the media, how I got publicity, those type of things, how I built an email list and built sites and whatnot. So you can sign up at uh, publisheracademy.com and it's just where I, my kind of like my outlet for giving back. Right. And the other thing is I have a, another book coming out, uh, America's Most Wanted Recipes is the title of the book. This one is going to be my fifth book. It's coming out early next year, probably like uh, April. It's going to be called America's Most Wanted Recipes at the Grill. So it's going to be like just in time for grilling season. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Favorite uh, copycat recipes. You can find my books also on Amazon. You know, my, my book, America's Most Wanted Recipes, has like all type of dishes from like your favorite restaurants and you ever wanted to know how to make those that you know right there in, in that book and it, you can check out some of the reviews like it's uh, overwhelming I'm, I'm so like uh so honored to have so many good reviews on on, on amazon about that book that book alone has sold over uh, 700,000 copies that's it's amazing copies. it's absolutely amazing i saw you cooking um i was watching the other day to prepare for this um the wendy williams show and that was yeah. just great <laughs> you're trying to make her you know, come on, put this chicken in the pan. <laughs> yeah, that was a crazy story, man. That was my first time uh, daytime television for that long of a segment, actually cooking live on the air. And I get there and her producers are telling me, like, you got to make sure your energy is high. Because I'm a laid back type of guy, like, you know, but they wanted me to make sure my energy was high. They wanted me to make sure that I get her involved in cooking. You know, they wanted me to get her involved. So those are my two directives from her producers, and I'm not sure if she knew about that, you know, so I get out there, so before I get on stage, um, backstage, I, I'm trying to get my energy up, I'm like, I'm shadow boxing, I'm jumping <laughs> up and down, I'm trying to get all hype, and you can see when I walk out on stage, and you, know, you can see it on YouTube, I'm like so happy, like, hey, you know, it's like all just kind of like <laughs> artificial energy that I've pumped myself up to do, and I get out there, and I'm, I'm, I'm cooking, I, I'm, I'm trying to make this uh, my version of a KFC recipe. And I'm trying to get her involved, and she would have no part of it. I know, it's she funny. She's kind of like, she, she was like almost like ruined the whole set. She almost dumped, uh, what was it, the something she was going to dump. Yes, the, the flour. flour. She yeah. was de- you're like, oh, just put it here. And she's like, here, and almost dumped the flour into the eggs. Yeah, and, yeah. And I was like, no, no, yeah. not there, not there. She, she's like, oh, that's why my food doesn't come out right. <laughs> and out of it. That was and then funny. after that, she didn't want to touch anything. She kind of, she put these like weird shades on, so like the grease was going to like splash on her or something. And she was just like, and then she started rushing me through the set. And it was just so weird. So, I mean, the producers thanked me. They said, you know, you, you did everything we told you to do. It was just a, a weird, weird type of uh, yeah. interview. I was just happy to be there because that was like, yeah. that was major for me at the time, you know, daytime television. Yeah. I mean, that was just internal because I was watching and I'm thinking, oh, this is cool. This is great. And I wasn't, you were just think, trying everything, you know, make everything go perfect. But, you know, no one would know that anything didn't go right. You know what I mean? So, um, came out okay. Yeah. So sh- people should check out publishersacademy.com. Uh, Publish, Publisher Academy. Publisheracademy.com and recipesecrets.net and. Check out the books. I mean, the books are cool. I mean, just recipes from all different restaurants, um, the, the recipes that you are wondering what they're, you know, how they're creating it. Um, so my last question, Ron, is this. What happens is, you know, when you become, you overcame all this, you become successful. There are certain people in our lives that kind of deflate our head or our ego. They keep us grounded and centered. And one of those people tend to be our wives. Tell me a story 
about when your wife just put you in your place. <laughs> right, right, right. So this is my, my very first interview, you know, on television. It was Fox Business. This was 2008. And um, my, my publicist had contacted me the day before I was supposed to go on, like, you know, 4 o'clock in the afternoon saying they have an opening on Fox Business tomorrow at 7 a.m. Uh, can you make it? And, of course, I had to. I couldn't say no. I, you know, this is a huge opportunity. And he said, he said by the way, they want you to, to cook uh, three of your, I think it was two or three of your uh, best dishes, including the KFC recipe dishes from your, your cookbook. And I said, great, great. So I hung up the phone, and I'm like, oh, damn, now I have to go get the ingredients. I have to go to the supermarket. I have to prepare this stuff. I have to get, you know, proper, like, uh, things to carry it in, and bowls and whatnot, and utensils. And, you know, I was pretty much up all night cooking the food and getting ready and prepping for the interview. And I left the kitchen a mess and, um, you know, all type of dishes in the sink and whatnot. So I get there on the interview and I get there and, I, you know, it's a, I think it was like an eight minute segment. And I did well. And, and then, you know, I get home, they, they send a black car for me. So I'm in this black car and I'm feeling like a star and I'm driving back home. They, they drive me home in this black car and I get home and I walk through the door. I come in walking like a big shot, like, you know, I've just been on TV. And I, I say to my wife, hey, did you see me? Did you see me on TV? What would you think? She's like, yeah, yeah, you did good. Are you going to wash those dishes in the sink? <laughs> so it was like, so immediately brought me right back down to earth. And I, I had to go in and, and, and clean up the kitchen right from the black car after my television appearance. So I love that I story. Kind of, yeah. Thanks for sharing, Ron. Ron, this has been unbelievable. Thank you for kind of inspiring us, telling us your story and getting personal because this stuff is always not easy to share. And I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. You know, if it inspires somebody, you know, I think it's well worth it. And thank you for having me on the show. And it's been, it's been fun. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Take care.